We know from the research that having intimate relationships is the key to mental and physical health. But what exactly qualifies as intimacy? Today, I'm gonna to teach you what intimacy really is and the seven habits of intimate relationships backed by research so you can build connection, joy, and ease in all your relationships. So stay tuned. Hi there, welcome back to the podcast. You know who I am, Dr. Abby Metcalf. And by the way, if you write in or say anything, it's just Abby. You know, I don't make anybody call me Dr. Abby. I use that, obviously, for social proof that I, I do have a degree. <laughs> I, I have studied, but I don't expect anyone to address me that way. So Dr. Midcalf, you know, none of that. <clears throat> just putting that out there. A lot of times I get things to say, hi, Dr. Abby. Just say Abby. We're just, we're just first name, you and I. We're all good. So love this topic. I got to tell you right now, there is so much research packed into this episode that I'm, and I'm not going to, I'm going to say at different times back by the research or in the research, but all of it, and I mean all of it, and it's a lot, are all linked. Come to the relationship tips and tools. Look at the blog for this episode. If you want to go deep and you want to get into everything, it's all there. Some of it or a lot of it will be on the show notes page also. If you look it up by the podcast on my on my website. But um, if you don't believe me or you, you want to know more, it's all there for you to go down that rabbit hole. You, we all know I love to research. It's like my porn. Um, I just, I dig it. I just dig it. I love going down the rabbit holes. I love reading the studies. I, I, I actually, it's a problem because sometimes I get too far down. Like this episode took me much longer than usually I devote to an episode. <laughs> uh, the time I usually do researching because I just went down too many rabbit holes. I was having too much fun and I couldn't stop myself. So, but I get asked about intimacy a lot and I find that people are confused by intimacy a lot. So, <clears throat> I think, you know, talking about the research and really what it means from a from that perspective. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you're just listening to people throw the term around and you don't, you know, what does it really mean? Or are we all talking, is it comparing apples to apples, you know, or apples to gorillas, you know, what what is that? So, and although we'll mainly be discussing intimate romantic relationships today, I'm, I also will be throwing in the word friendship a lot. Um, and there's no one kind of intimate relationship. I think it gets a little tough when we're talking about maybe our mom or our sister or something. That can totally be an intimate, healthy relationship, but it can also be a very unhealthy relationship, as all of, it, as all of them can. We can have unhealthy friendships and with our partners. Um, you just have to be careful more, I think, with family, like around enmeshment and some of the you know boundaries that get too thin. So that's why I really like looking at the research and really pinpointing what I'm talking about. Um, but having, uh, but I think mostly I'm going to be talking today about, <clears throat> excuse me, romantic relationships, or that's how you're you're going to think about it. But also friendships. I I talk a lot about my wife. <laughs> I always say every woman should have a husband and a wife. Um, I think even lesbians, I'm going to throw that out there. I don't know. I've had this conversation with some of my clients who are lesbians and they say the same thing. So there you go. Every woman needs one of each. Um, you know, I, I, I have my, I have, and I do have really close, some other really close girlfriends, but I definitely have this one sort of, you know, my Rhonda, who's like my ride or die. Um, you know, just we met in Israel 30 something years ago now, 40 years ago now. How long ago is that? Oh my gosh. I don't even want to think about how old I am. Um, and it's about 40 years. And um, when we were both on a program abroad there and, um, you know, we just, that was it. And we came back to the States uh, and we continued our friendship all these years. So, and it is just one of those, it's a very, very, intimate relationship. Gary always kind of jokes that he's worried that Rhonda and he will both need a lung on the same day because he knows who's getting it <laughs> or like a kidney or something. <laughs> um, and he's right. I love him, but he's right. So anyway, um, let's hope nobody needs one. Okay. So there is no one kind though of intimate relationship. I just want to say that you can 
I, I don't want people to feel judged if you have a different kind of relationship with someone like, you know, as long as it's sort of following the healthy guidelines, I'm cool, you know, whatever that is, I'm cool. So I want to give a little background first uh, and it, not too much. We're going to jump into those seven things, um, but I, I do want to give a little like, you know me, I always like some context before I start talking to you about something. So there... I, and this is according to these two legendary theorists, Roy Baumeister and Mark Leary. <clears throat> um, I talk about Baumeister a lot. I hope I'm saying his name right after all these years. I think I am. <laughs> it might be totally different. Um, but according to them, in their research, there's a, a human need to belong in close relationships. And, and in fact, they say that to function in a normal, healthy way, we need frequent, satisfying interactions with intimate partners. Again, not meaning a romantic partner, but intimate partners in lasting, caring relationships. Okay, so I am going to use that word partner in a lot of ways today. Please, again, if you don't, if you're not in a romantic relationship, and maybe you're someone who doesn't want to be in one, that is fine. You still need intimate relationships. Okay, so again, and you'll see that this fits. Uh, fits the bill no matter who we're talking about. Um, and it's really felt like this is why we're driven to establish and maintain close relationships with other people. We're literally hardwired to want connection and interaction with those who know and care for us. So now, and here's what's important. You don't need many of these relationships. In fact, when, when your need is to belong is satisfied, your drive for any additional relationships is actually diminished. So our biology tells us that quality in our relationships is more important than quantity. And I, it's interesting because I think of so many clients I speak to and they'll say, well, you know, I really want to make more friends. And, you know, they'll start telling me about their life and they have kids and they, you know, they have a relationship maybe with one of their siblings and their parents and they have a you know, a, a really great best friend, maybe even two, and their partner, and they're looking for more. I'm like, what more? Like, what? why do you feel like you need to have 50 people? And I don't, you know, I have, there's a lot of people I really love and feel close to in this world. I don't know that all of them in the category of an intimate relationship. So again, I have more girlfriends than Rhonda in the intimate relationship category. I do. Um, but, uh, and I'm sure she does. I think she has other friends. You know, you're allowed. It's it's. Remember, love is not a pie. It's it's <laughs> it's abundant. <laughs> um, but I, I don't have a ton. I just don't. You know, and I, I'm always open to new relationships. I've I've made new friendships. Uh, I'm I do make I add friends. I do. It's very carefully. I'm very discretionary with my time. I try to be very discretionary in my time. And so I'm very careful with sort of who comes in the fold as far as, you know, a lasting relationship, which is one of the one of the pieces of an intimate relationship, which, which again, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So what we're looking for from our friendships and partnerships is stable affection and acceptance. I want to say that again. What we need, what we're looking for is stable affection and acceptance. So and when those aren't fulfilled, we continue searching. And this is likely, I think, why some of my clients don't feel like they have enough friends or some of the people I meet. They're, excuse me, they're not getting what they need. They're not feeling, you know, sated in a few key relationships. So they continue to draw in new people, hoping that for that, you know, elusive feeling. And I wanna say that to you. So if you're one of those people like a lot of my clients, then I want you to really be listening well today because it's likely that you are not fulfilling the needs of an intimate relationship. And so just adding to the mix isn't going to do it. Okay. So, and I just want to give a few of, there's so much research on this. Okay. And again, I went down such rabbit holes, but I'm, I, I'm keeping this very succinct, <laughs> but I want to share some of the facts we know about having close ties and intimacy with others. So w first studies have found that we live longer, healthier, and happier lives when we're closely connected to other people. Get this, 
Just holding your partner's hand when something threatening happens reduces your brain's alarm bells and physically calms your nervous system. Uh-huh. And this is so crazy. I just, I'm throwing in this really weird stat I found, really weird study. But if, and again, it's not just one study that says these things. I'm going to link to like one study for you guys, but I read multiple studies saying the same things. But, you know, I'm not writing a research paper here, so I'm not going to, you know, link to every single one. But... Uh, so there's nothing I'm telling you that was from like one study or one, you know, we're studying seven people in Arizona. Like, you know, these are large scale studies over long periods of times that have been replicated multiple times. Um, so this other study I found or studies I found say that your wounds will even heal faster when you feel other support and accept you. I'm like, I like, what? I think it's crazy, but it's the truth. So in general, people who have what are called pleasant and satisfying interactions with the people who care about them report being more satisfied in their lives than those who don't. And there were a bunch of studies showing that this is true around the world. So I, you know, I have listeners and I think it's 180 countries now. Thank you. Hi everyone. And, uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate everyone listening and I'm so grateful. Um, and so I do my best to not just look at research that's done in the United States. Um, I'm not going to lie. That's the predominant research I look at because that's predominantly my audience. However, because I have so many people in way to go Australia, you're usually my number two, holy cannoli, Canada, Great Britain, but also, oh my gosh, you know, uh, Korea and Russia and Mexico. And I mean, there's countries around Malaysia, there's countries around the world where people are listening. So I really try to go look. So, and I'll tell you that studies have also shown that this is true. Everything that most of what I'm saying anyway, is true around the world. True around this thing about intimate relationships, it is cross-cultural. So, <clears throat> excuse me, and studies have been done to show it. And again, I'll link to those studies on the, on the page. So if you want to go look and see that I'm not lying. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't lie. Why would I lie? But you can go look and you could look for yourself and see all the things they found because it's really fascinating. If you're a nerd like me, <laughs> you'll geek out. All right, I'm going to sip some water because clearly I sound a little hoarse. <clears throat> okay. And there have also been studies that show that people without enough intimacy in their, in their relationships are at risk for a lot of different mental and physical health issues. And I would, I'm just gonna give you a couple. The biggie that I found that was crazy is that people without intimate relationships have much higher mortality rates um, than people with more intimate relationships. Again, this doesn't have to be, we know that there's research that married people live longer, but you know what? I didn't actually include that here because I'm not some big advocate that you have to get married. And when I'm talking about intimacy today, I, I am not, you know, like you have to get married. That is not my thing. Again, I think so many people have really opted out of marriage and I am fine with it. I, I so I don't want to, and I think there's a lot, there's a lot of con, what we call confounding variables there. When we talk about married people living longer, I don't know that that's because they have intimate relationships. Do you know what I'm saying? So I, I just think it's too weird. Like it, it gets too conflated. I, I'm not, so I didn't touch that. I'm just letting you know, that's not what I'm talking about. But we do know that people who report and fit the bill and check the boxes for more intimacy in their relationships, they, I mean, the, the people that don't, sorry, the people that don't have those things, I mean, they have much higher mortality rates. Some of the studies show nine times as high. I mean, it's crazy, it's crazy. There's also studies showing that young adults have who don't have intimate relationships have weaker immune systems get sick more often i mean have more depression anxiety it goes on uh again more psychiatric issues uh, and uh not just anxiety and depression disorders and depression but also substance abuse problems so and i've often said that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety it's connection and so you know that's really what we're looking for in life that's how we're kind of built so and i and let me just say this you you could argue that people who are prone to psychological issues would naturally have poor connections and you know not as intimate relationships with others i get that but there's actually been research showing that a lack of intimacy 
can cause these problems and exacerbate them, make them worse if they're already there. So I do want to say that like that. Again, I know I have some of you who are like, well, you know, <laughs> and I want to speak to everyone. So uh, anyway, so I just want to be clear. And and here's what's really amazing for like just to again, I did a lot of research here because I love you so much and because I'm such a nerd. The research shows that these all these findings for when you have more intimate relationships and when you don't hold true, whether you're gay or straight, married, living together, or in a, you know, just what you consider a long-term relationship. How do you like that? How do you like that? So I mean, it's incredible. And a lot of the newer research is, incorporates trans people and it goes on and on. It's really great. Um, I'll, I'll talk about one of the books later that really covers a lot of this, but so let's get to it let's get to our seven habits of intimate relationships backed by research okay <laughs> so let's talk first about what qualifies a relate like what makes a relationship intimate okay so again thankfully there's been a ton of good research in this area most notably what i found that people came back to over and over are, are the work by two professors at Haifa University in Israel. Uh, two shout outs to Israel today. Uh, Aditel Benari and Yoav Lavi of uh, Haifa University in Israel. A lot of the um, findings in other books and articles points back to their research or expounds on their research. So uh, Roland Miller or Rowland, sorry, Roland, Rowland, I think it's Rowland. Sorry, I apologize. There's a W in his name. Rowland Miller, who last I read is a professor of psychology at Sam Houston State University in Texas. He's notably, I mean, very notably been summarizing all the important research in the field of intimate relationships. He has a, a book, or I think it's a textbook, really. It's a book I always own um, called, you guessed it, Intimate Relationships. And I think he's been teaching a course on intimate relationships there, that university for like 30 years or something. Anyway, if you really want to delve deep into the research, this is the book to read because you'll find everything in one place. He, you know, he's got all the sightings of everything. I think the book is like in its ninth or 10th edition. Maybe it's more. Uh, it gets updated with newer and more relevant research all the time, which I love. Again, incorporating trans people and, you know, more back in lesbian relationships. And uh, he does an excellent job. And I... Um, I'm always getting the newer edition when I can. So I'm, that's, I, I don't have, of course, I don't have it here in my office in this moment um, because I lent it to someone recently, but uh, it is really has, if you just want one book, just go get that. You know, that has the research, that has what's been found, and that has all, all the things, much more than what I'm teaching today. So what Benari and uh, Lavi found is that, and I hope I'm saying both their names right. I think I am <clears throat> trying my best. Israeli accent um, is that the most what they found is that the most infant intimate and satisfying so a you know also known as happy right relationships are different than casual relationships in seven distinct ways okay so that's what I you know me that's what I love what makes something intimate from the research versus more casual you know wh why do we call one this versus that and he, they have found seven distinct ways, which again have been uh, expounded upon in the research, have been replicated in other studies and findings. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> seven things, seven distinct ways. Uh, though, and let me just say them quickly. Those are uh, knowledge, interdependence, caring, trust, responsive, responsiveness, mutuality, and commitment. Those are the seven. And I'm going to go over each one right now. And you know me, some little things to think about not, like they're not exactly tips but i guess it's a tip Wh what you can do to improve this area if you think that it's lacking okay so number one knowledge as i said so when you know when we're creating a deeper more intimate relationship with someone we share a lot of personal information that you I hope wouldn't feel comfortable sharing with just anyone i mean i guess this depends on your boundaries uh, but I think you're not going to share with your intimate partner or your best, best, best friend, um, you know, what you share with the person delivering your mail. I, I again, I hope not because that would scale your, scare your mail person. <laughs> um, but these are things we, you know, that are really just for this person. 
we talk, I don't know why I'm like not speaking well. So we talk about, you know, what do we talk about? We talk about everything. We talk about our, our, our goals, our future, our dreams, our desires. Um, we talk about our present, right? Our, our feelings about something, our work, you know, what's happening with the family, what's happening in our work life, all that. And of course we share our past. And I think we do that a lot in the beginning of a relationship, of course, as we're getting to know someone, we, you know, our past relationships with our own family, with friends, with work, with romantic relationships, with any traumas we've had, any notable times in our lives, with the sports we played, with the grades we got, you know, whatever, what schools we went to. We really share so much knowledge. And the, re the research, by the way, and no one's going to be surprised by this, shows that women will share this information with with not just their partners, but also with friends, like I do with my Rhonda or my other friends. Um, but then, but men, shockingly, not shockingly, historically only share these intimate topics with their romantic partners, with the women or men in their lives. Um, romantic men or women in their lives. Uh, I, you know, I wasn't shocked to see that part of the research, but you know, there you go. So. The, the point is that we feel safe to share this confidential, uh, what do you want to call it? It's, it's confidential, deeper knowledge, right? We, we feel safe to share this deeper, this confidentiality, this deeper knowledge in a reciprocal way, right? And that reciprocity and that way we share is usually gradual over time when you think about it, when you you know first get to know someone. Maybe you have the first all night, staying up all night talking with the girlfriend or with a, a partner or whoever, <clears throat> or a friend. But over time, you know, things just come out, right? Things just sort of get dropped as, you know, and you, you maybe get on a topic and you start really talking about it in a deeper way. So, what are the things to think about? I, I think first you need to notice how much you share or don't in your intimate relationships. Are there areas that are off limits? If so, why? This is again all about self-reflection for you to notice. What am I afraid of with intimacy? What, uh, what do I like about it? What am I afraid of? What am I doing or not doing? And to do that, we want to have some self-awareness. We want to be self-reflective, right? Um, are there things you tell your friend versus your partner? Like there are, like my, I gotta tell you, Rhonda knows all. If anybody really wants to know everything about me, go find Rhonda. Um, but <laughs> Gary knows most, I think at this point, but first of all, I've known Rhonda longer. Um, she's been there with my family in different ways. You know, um, my, my dad had already died by the time I met Gary. You know, Rhonda knew my dad. You know, like just, she was, I was around my siblings more when we were 19, you know, than I am at, you know, almost 60. It, it's, right, it's very different. So she, you know, has this different memory and, and shared uh, thing than, than Gary might. And I do share more even in my day-to-day -day life with her. There's things, um, I don't know, I just, I, I don't always love Gary's responses to things. It's, it's nothing wrong. It's just, you know, I, I think, like for example, even if I tell him I want comfort, not solutions, he has a, such a hard time not fixing things. <laughs> Ex-Navy man, just wants to fix shit. Um, and so sometimes I don't want to hear it. So I just tell, you know, it's okay. If it's anything really big, of course I share it with him. But you know, the little day-to-days things, uh, oh, oh my, any struggles I have with like um, food or weight or exercising or, you know, if I've gained a few pounds, I don't share that shit with Gary. Like, I want him to only look at me like the sexiest woman in the world. I'm not sharing, you know, oh, uh, I have hair on my chin that I have to pluck. You know what I mean? I know, women over 50, you see me. Um, I, I don't want to share that with <laughs> some of you are so grossed out right now. That's okay. You can you can you can stay here. We're we're being intimate. We're being close. You're sharing personal knowledge. I know too far. TMI, Abby. Anyway, but you know what I mean. There's just stuff I don't share. But with Rhonda, there's like nothing, pretty much nothing I don't share. Now, having said that, I don't get into the intimacies of my sex life with Gary or things like that that I know that Gary would be upset if I shared. Um, I don't. I don't do that. He, Gary's relatively private, so <laughs> you're like, 
I've heard things about your sex life, Abby, and I don't think Gary would like that since you're sharing it with hundreds of thousands of people. But that, there you go. Gary, Gary understands. <laughs> but I mean in a deeper way other than like, you know, he got a blowjob this morning or something. I, you know, in a really deeper way, I, I don't. I don't share it with you and I don't share it with Rhonda. I don't, I, you know, that stuff I talk to him about. So th there's, there are lines everywhere, but there's, you know, again, like, where are you sharing things? Why? And I do think about why I don't share things with Gary versus Rhonda or someone else or one of my other girlfriends. And there have been times when I haven't shared something with him and I went on self-reflection, I realized it wasn't healthy. I was like, oh, I'm avoiding an argument or I'm avoiding, you know, a confront or like some sort of what I perceive a confrontation with him. Um... I don't want to hear his opinion. I want to go do what I want to do. You know what I mean? Like, so it's it's good to to look at it, to try to be self-aware. Um, I use therapy for that too. Um, sometimes my therapist will say something because I'll say I said something to Rhonda maybe and she'll say like, well, does Gary know? <laughs> like, oops. Um, I will also say that a lot of this, you know, I've, we talk about attachment styles a lot here on the podcast, and I have a more avoidant attachment style. As much as I have worked on that, and I'm so much more secure than I ever was, and I continue to work on that, always my go-to is to be a little more avoidant. And so I have to really watch that, and that gets in the way of these intimacy factors, as you might imagine. So does anxious attachment, by the way. That gets in the way of intimacy, too. I mean, secure attachment is the only thing that's really the good, the good news in there. But um, these are things you want to be thoughtful about. Um, and hold on, I'm going to write that down to make sure that I have attachment <coughs> in the show notes so that we can link to the old episodes on that. All right. Number two is interdependence. So there's also, there is this high amount of interdependency in intimate relationships. And this means that people in intimate relationships, they're, they're entwined, intertwined and uh, with each other. They influence, that's the big word that's used, one another in large and small ways, but they're meaningful and important ways. And, and you know, sometimes small though, and sometimes not. And so it could be anything from, you know, where to live to spiritual beliefs to what to eat for dinner. You know, all these are things that are influenced with this interdependency we have. Um, there's a real, in intimate relationships, there's an understanding that what each person does affects the other in some way, right? So what you want to do versus what you think you can do in a relationship, that's an influence. You know, if I'm not doing everything I want to do, that means my partner, that I'm influenced by our interdependency, right? By this connection we have. And I will tell you, the research gets very specific on this particular one. It says that the influence has to have a few things. It has to be frequent, right? It happens often, this kind of influence, to be intimate. To, between the two of you, it's not a once a year thing. That it's strong, in other words, it impacts you meaningfully that it's diverse, it impacts um, the impact, it impacts each person in different, in many different ways. There's a lot of ways that we get impacted and it's enduring. It's the influences over a long period of time. So when all of those are present, we're really looking at this major interdependency between ourselves and this other person that we're in an intimate relationship with. Um, and you can be in a long distance, this is where like a long distance relationship, there's a little less of this obviously. And this is I think where long distance relationships can fall down a bit when they don't have that physical connection as often. Um, you know, your lives just aren't as intertwined. And so there are some intimacy aspects you don't have. This isn't to say you can't have an intimate relationship if you're in a long distance one. It is to say that it's different and that it's to a lesser degree because for sure you can't have some of this. Like you, if you don't live together and maybe aren't married and you have a long distance relationship, you know, you might not have bank accounts the same. You might not have any say or however the other person spends their money. Um, you know, day to day, you don't have to stop what you're doing other than maybe cheating or something. If you want to do that, you know, go have sex with someone else that might be out of the, that might be off the table. Um, but other than that, there's, you know, you can go and have fun with friends. You can, you can do things mostly that you would want to do anyway. So this is kind of not there for that. Um, so what to think about here, what to think about here is how much interdependence do you think you have 
in your different intimate relationships, okay? So how much is there? Just to look at that, to really see the, what I call the worlds collide thing, how much is that intertwining and how much are you, um, are these all of a piece? Now this doesn't mean, you know, I don't go out with my girlfriends, like Gary always has to come. I, I don't mean that in, again, I think that's enmeshment when couples can't spend any time apart. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about, but when I do go out with my girlfriends, um, uh, I would if I'm going dancing with my girlfriends. I wouldn't be dancing with other men. Gary would not appreciate that, and I'm not gonna. And I don't want to do that. So, um, do you know what I'm saying? Like I'm. But let's say I did want to. I don't know if I wanted to dance with other people. But if Gary didn't, you know, just didn't want me to dance with other men for whatever reason, and if I was okay with that reason, I. You know what I mean? It would be a conversation at least. And so I would be curtailing something I want to do versus what I'm doing. Does that make sense? So you, and again, all these things can get very weird if you're in um, a, a, a relationship with a narcissist or someone who's, you know, possessive or jealous. And that's all very unhealthy, obviously. So you really have to, you know, look at the line and where the line is. Because the other thing I would say to you is, is it reciprocal? You know, are you not supposed to go out with your girlfriends, but it's fine for maybe your partner to go out with his male friends or something like, you know, in a heterosexual relationship? Like, like, what does it mean? You know, are you not allowed to talk to the gender, the, the people you're attracted to, but is your partner allowed? Like, I don't, you know, there's a lot of things here. Um, I'm working with one couple where the husband works with his ex, an ex uh, girlfriend that he was with for about a year. Um, and, uh, but the wife doesn't care at all. Like there's nothing there. She knows there's nothing there, but he gets crazy when she's around an ex boyfriend of hers, um, who she doesn't see often, but occasionally sees and they, they catch up together. Um, do you know what I mean? So we've been talking about that. What does that mean? It's not quite reciprocal. How does that work? You know, you can't have different rules for everybody necessarily. So what, what do you do about that? Um, I want you to think about, you know, what are your thoughts and feelings about what you want to do versus what you can do in your relationship? Okay. I've had problems with, let's see, uh, porn comes up a lot. I've had, you know, men maybe who want to watch porn, their partner doesn't like it. So they stop watching or do they, you know? Um, there's all that, like how much, do they have resentment about that? Are they okay with that? Do they really understand? Is there empathy? Is there understanding? Is there support? Or maybe you want to send your kids to private school, but your partner says no way. You know, what are the things that you want that aren't happening? And is that again, going both ways? Do you, you know, is the influence the same both ways? Have you put yourself completely into your partner's life, but they have not put them, your, themselves into your life? right? I see that happening. I see, sadly, women do this a lot, where they sort of give up the things that were important to them, it seems, like their friendships or hobbies or whatever, because, and they just are with their partner. Um, I should say I've seen women in heterosexual relationships do this the most. I'm trying to think, I work with a lot of same-sex relationships. I'm trying to think, I, I can't say for sure off the top of my head, but for sure I see it in heterosexual relationships. So you uh, do you get overly influenced by your close relationships? That could be with friends too. You know, if you have a real intimate friendship, are you suddenly really influenced by that? You know what I mean? In, in too many ways, maybe. Again, just things to think about, okay? Not to, you don't have to judge it. You don't have to freak out, but start to think about it and really um, have a sense of what feels healthy and what doesn't. Number three is care. And when we talk about care in intimate relationships, we're talking about the, the amount of time and attention each person has with the other that's different than the kind of care you'd show to, I don't know, like, again, your male person, right? Or your, or, or your neighbor. Right? Care is all about the concern you show for the, for the well-being, the safety, and the comfort of this other person. And in the end, there's genuine selfless care for one another, right? There's a, there was, there's a responsiveness you have when the other person is hurting or when they need something. Um, and again, that it's different than what you would show to just anybody. So the things to think about are, 
you know, you want to make sure that you're showing care to your partner or again, or friend, whoever is this prime, these primary intimate relationships. That's different than what you show other people. If, and I see a lot that people will show care to somebody at work or to a boss or to a, you know, their mom or to somebody else and not to their partner or not to their primary relationships in another way. And I'm like, uh, you know, it, that person has to feel special. They have to feel like what they have with you is a little different than what you give or have with other people. Um, so think about that. How do you show your intimate relationship person that you care for them? How do they show you? These are really good questions. Again, not to judge anything else, but to be self-reflective and ask. Okay. Number four is trust. You knew we were going to get to trust because how could it not be in an intimate relationship, right? And trust, when you look at all the research on this, trust is often seen as the glue that holds all these seven habits together. And I, you know, I have written a ton about and talked a ton about trust. So I'm going to be brief here and I will... I will link to other episodes I've done on trust, but what I've talked about before, and I'll mention again briefly, is that trust, I call it the trust triad. Trust is comprised of three components, and those are competence, goodwill, and integrity. Competence in any relationship, of course, is huge. Is, you know, does the other person do what they say they will do, and do they do it successfully and efficiently? Do they follow through? Do they show up on time? Do you believe that they can do the things they promise or commit to? In other words, you know, can they do the job of being your partner or friend? Okay, so are they competent? The second factor, goodwill. It's all about, uh, you know, really believing that the other person has your best interest at heart and that they care about you as a person, not just the role you fulfill, right? So not just the fact that you're a wife or a brother or a mother or whoever. We tend to build goodwill as we express, um, as we show compassion and empathy for other people's feelings. It's when we stop and give our full attention, we listen well, we ask good questions. It's when we approach things as you know a we, not a you problem, okay? That's really where the goodwill is, that I have your back, I'm thinking of you before I make decisions. And integrity is all about honesty. Our, our they saying something so you won't get upset? So are they being dishonest? Are they trying to manipulate you to get their way or avoid a conflict? That's dishonest. Are they saying they feel one way, but they think, but you think they really feel another way? Are they telling you outright lies? All of this relates to honesty. And uh, Rowland, who I talked about before, says that, um, Miller, uh, says that trust is the confidence you place in another human being to act in a way of honor and fairness that is of benefit to both of you. Or at the very least, that won't cause purposeful harm. I, and I think that's a good, I hope I'm quoting him correctly. Sorry about that. Sorry, Rowland, um, <laughs> if I got that wrong, but I know I'm pretty close. Uh, I'll make sure it's correct in the blog. So. The research clearly shows that intimacy increases when people believe their partners appreciate, understand, and respect them, and when they believe the other person is concerned with their health and welfare, okay? That's, that's really what the trust is about. So, so what to think about, what to mull here, I would say, are there areas of the trust triad you could work on? That's number one. You know, if you're thinking about how you are with the intimate relationships in your life, is your honesty on point, your integrity? Is your competence on point? You know, do you show up when you say you're gonna? Do you follow through on things? And do you, are you putting their needs, not their needs first, but are you thinking of them and not just yourself, right? Goodwill. So, are there areas you have to work on? Often there's only, I kind of, I like the trust triad because it's really, you might be really good in one area and not in another. So it's helpful to focus where you're, you know, kind of not good. Um, okay. Sorry, blow my nose. Okay. Are there areas of the trust triad you'd like your partner or friend to work on? In other words, when you're thinking of your trust with this other person, 
uh, is there a place in the trust triad where they where they kind of fall down and and maybe you know again reflect on that like oh how could we work on this how could this happen you know um, I'm realizing that the reason I don't trust them is really you know I, I I trust them not to cheat or steal money or anything, but I don't trust them in this way. You know, how could we work on that together? Uh, another thing you could think about is I ask this a lot. You know, where would you rate trust on a scale of one to six with the other person? You know, I love a one to six scale because you can't pick a middle number. So it's great. And then, of course, what would it take to make it a six is always the part that comes after that. Um, but I, I, just to think about it in general, when you think about, if I thought about Gary and I thought a scale of one to six, how much do I trust him? And just to have that right there, when I think about Rhonda, when I think about these other people, how much do I trust them? And scale of one to six. And it can really help you again, get clear on why intimacy might be breaking down. Um, cause I think a lot of times people think of trust as very black and white and they'll think, oh, I trust my partner. They're not going to cheat. They're not going to do this. Not gonna, but do you really trust them in these other ways? Have they, you know, do they, are they always late for dinner? Do they always tell you a time they'll be home and they never are? You know, that breaks down your trust, which breaks down your intimacy. And it's really good for your partner to kind of, everyone, for not just your partner, but you too, everyone to put that sort of thread together to really see how all these things impact, because um, it's important. Okay, number five of the seven is responsiveness. and. Being mutually responsive to each other's needs is, a, it's really another, it's just a, a hallmark of healthy, intimate relationships. So in practice, this shows up as understanding and supporting one another in good times and bad. So whether you're dealing with your dad's death or getting a big promotion at work, you feel like the other person is there with as much feeling, as much empathy, if that's the situation, as much enthusiasm, if that's the situation, as you. It's when you feel seen and fully supported with both your wins and your losses, with your you know strengths and your limitations, with your struggles and not. That's what this is. So the things to think about here are, very direct, like how does my partner or friend, whoever this person is, show up for me when I've had a loss or a fail of some kind? How, what do I think about that? How does my partner or friend show up for me when I've had a win of some kind? You know, sometimes people are great with the loss, but not so great when you've got something good. They don't, they don't seem to be, be there when something great goes on. And then think about how do I show up when my partner or friend when, when they've had a loss or a fail of some kind? Or how do I show up when they've had um, a win of some kind? You know, like, how do I show up for that? Okay. Number six is mutuality. So mutuality is something I discuss in another way in my TEDx talk. If you haven't seen that, if you haven't seen my TEDx, you should. I will have that everywhere. You can look up Abby Metcalf TED Talk in, in you know, YouTube and you'll find my little chat there. You should check it out. I highly recommend it. Give it a like if you do. I'd appreciate it. Um, so, and in it, I discuss the real reason relationships fail. And it's all about, <clears throat> but this top this particular number <laughs> is all about the same very similar thing which is transitioning from me to we and it's that that shift from seeing yourself only as you and your needs getting met to a more team focus and this is when you know you stop saying, oh, I'll be there with my boyfriend or and you start saying we'll be there <laughs> right you go from like you know, me and this other person to we will be there. And that that we concept is is a big one. You in 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 a in a romantic partnership, you really start to see yourself as truly a couple and not just a single person. And in friendship, it's that I think it's that deep knowing that no matter what, this person has your back and you're not alone in the world ever. <clears throat> I'll tell you, Rhonda sent me, if I'd thought about it, I would have pulled it out before this. She sent me this like coin and it's engraved and it says ride or die. It's like this big piece of silver. It's beautiful. And I have it in my wallet in my change compartment. So every time I go in my change, I see it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it says ride or die. And it's just that, right? This is this, it's this beautiful reminder I always have of, of her love and that she's there even when I'm feeling alone or, um, 
on my own in some way that I know this person's there. You know, it's pretty great. So with mutuality, you're, you're noting your close connection to another person. And it really is something that changes, that informs your outlook, your thoughts, your actions. Um, it's, it's very interesting to have that kind of, again, we thing. So what to think about here? How often do you, you use we language when there's a problem between you and your partner or you and your friend, right? How often does your partner use we language when there's a problem between you? Okay, because that can happen a lot. There's a problem and all of a sudden you have the problem. You know, they're pointing at you and you're not a couple anymore, right? It's, it's you versus me. This is all the stuff I talk about with competition in the relationship and keeping score. But um, do you feel alone or part of a team when hardships or obstacles come your way? That is really, you know, I, uh, you got to look at your life. You know, when I have anything hard in my world, I know Rhonda will be there in a second. I know Gary will be there in a second. I know my friend Stephanie will be there. Like I have people I know I could call and just boom, they would literally get on planes, trains, and automobiles to be there for me or to listen. Um, and that's big. You, you want to think about your life. And again, to listen. So you might always think, well, I can call my mother, but then you don't like calling your mother because she'll just berate you for the fact that you have this obstacle or this problem. And you know what I mean? That's not intimate. You know, you want to feel again that support and that we ness. Like, what do we need to do? What's what's in it? You know, what do what do we have to think about? And number seven is commitment. So, commitment means you both want the relationship to continue basically indefinitely. And this is how I think those other habits really start to flourish when you when you both agree that you're in this with no end in sight. Your trust begins to deepen, you share more knowledge and feelings, right? Your true feelings become more vulnerable. You allow yourself to become more we than me. I mean, all of the things we just talked about start to really flourish and blossom and grow. And I'll tell you one of the things that happens when I meet with couples that might be happening with you, if you've gone to, ever gone to couples therapy or you're thinking about it, is I'll meet with them and they'll often say something like, or when I'm first talking to them actually, because I don't meet with them if they continue to think this way. If they say to me, um, well, we would like to do some couples therapy and then we're gonna see how that goes and then we'll decide if we're gonna stay together. And I'm like, forget it. I don't work with those couples. I don't, I send them on their way. Because if you don't, you have to, you've gotta be committed. If you want couples therapy to work, the commitment has to be there. I don't know what else to say. You don't have to commit for the rest of your life, but you have to say right now, you have to just suspend belief that there's any space, like we're together, I'm not gonna waffle, I'm not gonna think if we're not for the next six months, three months, whatever it is, but you, and I would say no shorter than three months, but you really have to make the decision to commit fully. Um, you know, if you run a marathon, if, if you decide to run a marathon, if you sign up for a marathon, you have to commit. You you might get there and not run it. <laughs> you might get to the end and feel like I cannot run this marathon or you might quit halfway through, but you have to commit every day. Okay, I gotta run this many miles. I have to do this, I have to do this. And by the way, when you do all that, often people do finish, but even when they don't, you still feel better. You still, you're more fit at the end. You, you've, you've done all that training. You're in a different headspace. You might find at the end that, of the commitment that, you know what? I just want to know I could. And now I know I could. I don't have to run this race anymore. I don't know. I've, I've, actually, I do know. I've had people do that. It's the commitment that's so important. Um, so again, I always let people know it's a recipe for failure when they're saying, we'll see. Um, and again, as you look at this research I just gave you, you can see why. When there's no commit commitment there, the other six habits fall by the wayside. You're looking out for number one, more than investing in the couple and you know deepening your intimacy or your vulnerability. It, it just becomes impossible. So what to think about here? Um, how would I rate my commitment to my partner or friend on a scale of one to six? And if it's not at a six, what would it take to make it a six? That's what I would say to you. Uh, you really want to make sure you're committed fully. Okay, that's the seven. So I just want to wrap up by saying that, you know, when we're looking from a 50,000 foot perspective, which is what this is, 
um, intimate and meaningful relationships, if you're just up there, have all seven of these habits. They do, right? Again, from the research, that's what they have. However, you can certainly experience intimacy, maybe not as much, but you can certainly experience it by only practicing a few of these habits. And for any of us in long-term relationships, you know that your intimacy can vary greatly over the course of a relationship. So I also always want you to think like, did you just have kids? Did you, or did you just move? Did they just start a new job? Like there's times when the stressors really uh, decrease the intimacy in the relationship. And sometimes you can go through that for a while. Um, but at, you know, as I said in the beginning, there, there's no one size fits all. Relationships are incredibly diverse. They're incredibly complex. Uh, so I don't want you to think there's one thing, but I always stand by the research. And if you're not feeling a high level of satisfaction in your relationship, I'd suggest looking at each of these components and seeing which need the most attention. I don't want you to be overwhelmed if you think they all need some love, you know, all the components need some love. Okay. But start with one, work on it for a few weeks or a few days or a few whatever, and then slowly move to the next, you know? I mean, if you're committed, you've got a lifetime, right? So <laughs> you don't have to get it all done today, but I, I, I never give you this information with the thought that you'll feel overwhelmed or hopeless or helpless at the end. I give you the information because I want you to have the correct, you know, the, again, research-based information so you can make healthy decisions for you. And you might look at this list and go, oh my God, we have none of those and I've been unhappy for a long time. And you, this might be the conversation that lets you know that maybe I can never have an intimate relationship with my husband or wife. And in that case, you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? Do, do I want to stay in the relationship? Do I want to get those needs met elsewhere? And I don't mean by cheating. I, but I, you know, some people do that through friendships or their family, other people. The, the thing is you have to have intimate relationships. It doesn't, nowhere is it written that it has to, has to be your partner. I highly recommend that one of the people is your partner. I, I think that's a big deal, but you know, People are in partnerships for all different reasons. And again, I really don't want to judge that. I, I, I want you to decide. I just want you to have this intimacy somewhere. I want you to feel loved and cared for as you deserve, as it should be. And I want you to feel that kind of investment, love and care for others. I want you to feel what that vulnerable, close, safe feeling feels like. I, I wish that for you so, so much. So I hope you... I hope you were inspired today and not feeling like, oh my gosh, um, I want you to really, if you're not feeling inspired, I want you to just take a minute and breathe, go back through, talk to your therapist, you know, think a little more about it. You know, one episode of the podcast does not make or break your relationship or anything else, but I want you to be thoughtful about where, you're in, where the intimacy is in your life and how to have more of that. Okay. That's it for this week. Again, love, love spending this time with you. I love you. I think you're amazing. I, I have total faith that you can do the things you set out to do. So I just want you to have the same faith. And uh, remember to breathe this week. And I'll see you in a little bit.